Hello everybody, this is Dr. Anna, your uh, geology professor, and this is chapter 3 in historical geology. The title is The Origin and Interpretation of Sedimentary Rocks. There is not really a chapter to this in the book we use, so you have to gather the information from, solely from this slideshow. So let's do it. Um, in historical geology, as you know, we're learning about the history of the Earth. And we already discussed this question somehow and got to the fact that um, we would use the geologic principles and fossils to put together the, the Earth history puzzle. Uh, so therefore, we have to listen to the stories of the ancient environments, climate and paleogeography, which includes the paleolatitude and paleolongitude. And the only way you can get information about these things is that you learn how to read the rocks and how to hear their stories, uh, which means that, um, you know, the grain size, the shape of the grains, the majority of the sedimentary rocks will all tell us stories about how they formed, in what kind of environment, and what was the climate at the time. You can even read plate tectonics, and um, I hope I can teach you for all that. Um, and as you know, the principle of uniformitarianism really tells you to go out and learn the rocks now so you can actually read them back in time. I mean, you learn the environments today and so you can go back in time and, and read the environment just from using the rocks because you cannot see the parallel environment. So as a starter, this is the so-called hypsometric curve of the Earth. And um, if you're in my day classes, you will have to be able to draw it. But also if you're in my, in my distance learning class on the midterm, I'll ask this. So you must be able to, to reproduce this drawing. This is just showing the hypsometric curve. Which this here is the sea level. And uh, this is the highest elevation, which is Mount Everest. You got to know it's 8,848 meter. And the lowermost uh, point is the Mariano Trench next to Japan. And it's 11,000 meter. So in between these two extremes, we have the Earth. And um, just now, the, the continental crust is... Like, you know, the continents are covering 29% of, of Earth, and the oceanic crust is 71 today. And um, the continental crust actually goes all the way to the uh, edge of the continental shelf. So the edge of the, the continent, so basically the continental shelf area belongs to the continent. So underneath of here, everywhere, we have continental crust. as it says right up here, so I already have said it. And then you have to know this area right here, you know, we have the continental slope, the rise, the visual plane, and the deepest part is the trench. So when you re-watch re it, you won't have my drawings on it, so it's okay. Okay, so now we have to talk a little bit about the ecology, ecologic niche. Basically, when you think of ecologic niche, you have to think about that that's the, the sum of all activities and re relationship of space, species um, will do while obtaining and using the resources they need it uh, to survive and reproduce. Probably that's as you know, one of the more important things that we all reproduce, animals as everybody. Um, the species niche includes the habitat, which is where does that uh, organism live in the system, the ecosystem, the relationship, which, which includes all the interactions with other species, and then the nutrition, which is the method as the species obtaining food. Like as soon as you see fern, you need that they had to live in a relatively humid. Oh, sorry, it's, it's late. 
uh, humid conditions and if you see cacti you know that that means dry conditions so just by looking at the plants in present day environments you will know that if you see those fossils then if, if you see a fossil of fern then you know that it had to be extremely humid condition and if you see a, a cacti then you know it must have been really dry condition so this takes us to the communities of organisms and when when we have a population of several different organisms live together we call it ecological community um, and if you think about in these communities, the eating habitat will depend on the food chain or the food web in this environment. And uh, the organisms of a community and their physical environment is what we call ecosystem. And the animals of the ecosystem are called fauna. Remember fauna. And the plants are called flora. Don't mix the two. Okay, the plants are called flora. The diversity. The diversity is the most one of the more important thing because this is what we use to to define the different sedimentary environments. And if you want to separate lake from oceanic environments, it's really important. So diversity is describing the number of species which are living together in an eco ecological system. It is really nothing else but the account of the different species living in an environment. And this one is about the biogeography, which is the distribution and abundance of organisms on a broad geographic scale and we study them in the field which we know as biogeography. Now, what kind of limiting factors do we have with the distribution of life? First of all, the temperature. Uh, the temperature, if you think about, like we have the polar region, the Mediterranean, the tropical, um, so this is defined by the temperature. We also have land barriers, like land barriers would be a barrier for the aquatic forms, and we have water barriers, which are barriers to the terrestrial forms. Terrestrial, remember, is on the con everything on the continent. First, we're going to talk about terrestrial realm. When I say terrestrial realm, I'm talking about everything on the continents. So basically, this means the fauna and the flora of the continents. And um, it probably is hard for you to believe, but the sea level today is lower than most of uh, the during most of the geologic time. And also because we are in an ice age. Uh, right now the temperature gradient is pretty steep between the pole and the equator uh, so obviously we have more temperature control on the distribution of the of the uh, living things as you know that the climate conditions have a very important influence on the distribution of the organisms on land so this is very important. Even though you hear a lot about sea level going up, you've got to realize that it's still much, much lower than it's been during the Earth history. Like if, if I hope you are learning your timetable, if we go back to the Paleozoic, North America as a continent completely have been covered four times just during the Paleozoic by, by the ocean. So it is really much lower today than it has been before. So it is very important that we talk about the climate and vegetation and how is it relate to deposition and the animals and all that good stuff. So it is 
amazing how closely the the terrestrial vegetation, the plants, are related to the climatic patterns. So it's very important to understand actually that the plants are uh, the dominant producers for the food web. So their distribution strongly affects the distribution of the fauna also. So we're going to go through the different climate zones and uh, you have to know them and just know a couple of things about each of them. So we're going to talk about the tropical humid, the desert, tropical desert, savanna, Mediterranean, temperate forest, evergreen, tundra, and uh, the Arctic. And as you understand, if we go off around the earth you know this is the tropics and this is the arctic but if you go up in a ma uh, mountain like high latitude you will see all these zones like that too so whatever you walk through the earth like from equator to to the pole you can see the same kind of distribution if you go up to a mountain well that's just interesting so let's start with the tropical humid I should say the rainforest climate. On this map you can see the distribution. It's most there on the equator of course. So the temperature, the average temperature of a rainforest is between 18 and 20 uh, degrees Celsius. Don't forget science class so we have to talk in Celsius. But I did write down the, the Fahrenheit for you. Uh, the latitudes between 20, which means 0 and 20 north and south, right here. 0 and 20 north and south. That's the rainforest. The diversity is extremely high. Remember, this is what you see in the rainforest. Animals, plants, all that good stuff. I always pull myself close. Sorry. Um, the rocks, of course, are extremely weathered chemically. So the soil zone is very well developed uh, and very rich in nutrients. The next one is the tropical desert and this shows you the, the tropical desert but of course there are a couple of mid-latitude desert which can be related to mountain shadow effect. You know when you have a mountains along the shore and the wind is the trade wind is coming it has to go up in front of the mountain so all the rain will fall down fall out from the clouds and then behind the mountain you got the so-called uh, mountain shadow effect which means it's really a desert which makes it really interesting actually if you go to Oregon and you start driving from the Columbia River Gorge we have this uh, very interesting Mediterranean rain I mean mid-latitude rainforest in this area Oregon right at the beach and as you drive through the mountain like right here, you're actually going to a full desert. So this is rainforest and this is desert. It's really interesting. Anyhow, these are the tropical desert area and these are the mid, the mid latitude. There is a couple of mid latitude which relates to continental climate or mountain shadow effect. So what do we have? The tra in the tropical desert, the temperature, average temperature is between 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, for example, the Sahara, as you could see the previous picture, the diversity is extremely low. The temperature difference is pretty extreme during the day. It could be like uh, freezing at night and at the same time it can be as high as 130 degree during the day. Uh, the maximum amount of rain is 10, 10 inches per, uh, per year which is 25 centimeter. And most of this rain is usually falling during the springtime. The sediment around here are mostly physically weathered, there are no chemical weathering you could say and uh, most of the sand is transported by the wind so you, you have beautiful ripple marks and really pretty um, cross bedding uh, and I, I already kind of mentioned that you, you, you also have desert in other latitudes and they are either mountain shadow or continental climate deserts so you should know all that too.
this is just a slide showing the different um, uh, characteristics of a desert. Most of the time when in the spring you have rain, uh, the valley fills up with uh, water. And during the summer, when there is no rain, it will become actually salt. So you can taste the salt, you can dig in the salt, it's just all salt. These pictures were taken in that valley actually, so it's interesting. Um, the next uh, climate zone, the savanna, and this slide shows you the locations of savannas. And uh, the savanna is uh, in the savanna, you do have enough moisture uh, for grass and scattered trees, but not really enough for dense forest. For example, the Great Plain. The savanna is famous about the large amount of big animals like bosons, antelopes, zebras, elephants, and so on. The, we have very intensive chemical and physical weathering, so therefore there is very well-developed uh, soil in the savanna. That's a couple of pictures. The next climate zone is the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is most common around the Mediterranean Sea, but there is also some like in California. And what is characteristic? The characteristic is that the summer in the savanna is pretty, I mean in the Mediterranean is, is relatively dry, the winter is wet. Uh, most of them lie around the 40, 40 degree from the equator north. Uh, in these areas, it's very characteristic that we have this so-called chaparral vegetation, which means the plants have waxy leaves, which can stand the long, dry summer uh, because the, the waxy leaves hold the moisture in, so they will be okay. And in the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean climate, there is a lot of animals also. That's a very lovely, too lovely picture of the Mediterranean. And I guess I'm going to finish this segment right here. Uh, see you for now.